Income tax 2023-2024. Earned income tax credit, the EIC overview. Get ready and some coffee so we can avoid the government forcing us into a shack with income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in the Form 1040 Instructions Tax Year 2023 Tax and Credits section, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're on the bottom part of the income tax formula, looking at the refundable credits. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement, most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Taxable income, therefore, basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula, but it's only half the story. We then have the second half of the income tax formula where we take the taxable income, calculate the tax based on that, which is not as easy as you would think because we don't have a flat tax. We have a progressive tax system and some income items are subject to other tax rates other than the ordinary incomes, which we've talked about at prior sections and prior courses. So that gives us the tax before credits and other taxes. Then we have the tax credit and other uh, taxes. Other taxes could include things like self-employment tax for sole proprietor uh, Schedule C reporters, for example. And then the credits, remember, are similar in, in some ways to deductions in that both deductions and credits are good. But if you can get a dollar of a credit or a dollar of a deduction, you would rather have the credit because the deduction would simply decrease the taxable income, resulting in a tax benefit based on the tax rates, whereas a credit will likely give you a full dollar for dollar benefit. That's why it has to be down here at the bottom half of the formula because the other taxes that you would get are increasing your taxes dollar for dollar. The credits would be decreasing your taxes from dollar to dollar. Note that we have two categories of credits though. The ones up here are the non-refundable credits, meaning they can't take the tax liability below zero because they're in alignment with the general idea of taxes being that taxes are you paying the government, not the government paying you. So that means that the credits typically wouldn't take the liability below zero, but you have the credits down below here that are in the same area as the payments. These are refundable credits and could possibly take the liability below zero, in which case we are using the tax code not to collect taxes, but as a type of benefit or welfare type of program. So they're down here with the payments because the payments, such as withholdings from your W-2 income, could take the tax liability to the point where they give you a refund, right? They owe you money back in that case because you overpaid. Similarly, the credits, the refundable credits, 
could take your tax liability below zero, giving you a quote refund, end quote. But in that case, it's not a refund of overpayment, but instead, again, the use of the tax code as a welfare or benefit type program. Now, the earned income tax credit is the classic example of using the tax code as a welfare program or safety net type of program. That and the additional child tax credit, which is why the earned income tax credit is down here in the refundable credits section of the income tax formula. Now, a quick couple notes on the earned, earned income tax credit, and we'll show this in a lot more detail when we get to the tax software examples, because it's actually a quite complex uh, credit, the way it's structured, and it has many pros and cons. But from an economic standpoint, many economists like the fact that the earned income credit is actually going to require some earned income in order to generate the credit. Because one of the problems with welfare uh, type programs or safety net type programs is that there's usually an income threshold, which makes sense because we're trying to provide the income uh, the money to people that need the money who have financial difficulties. However, as soon as they earn some income, they often lose the entire benefit uh, from the welfare program or the safety net program. And in many cases, they actually start working and, and they earn less than they were getting under the benefit or safety net program, which doesn't make any sense. That will, of course, incentivize people not to be picking up work or to pick up work that is under the table that will not impact their earnings records so that they're still picking up the welfare or benefit program. That's not what we're trying to do with the program. The program you would think would be designed to help those that can be self-sufficient to become uh, self-sufficient, not to lock them down like an elephant stuck in tar or something like that, that they can't get out of the program because as soon as they take a step forward, they lose uh, all of the support. So the idea with the, the earned income tax credit is you actually get a benefit uh, for working. So the credit actually increases up to a certain point and then it decreases after that point. So many economists, including me, think that's that's a, a good idea to try to incentivize people to be uh, self-sufficient. However, there are many downsides to the earned income tax credit as well. One is that it's quite complex. You're talking about tax preparers that have low income thresholds and we have one of the most complex calculations of a credit here uh, to understand. Uh, so that's kind of an issue. You kind of almost have to have tax software to really do it properly, I would think, although many tax softwares are free out there uh, for many individuals. It's also tied to the number of children, which has, I can understand why that would be the case because people that have uh, uh, children are, are gonna have more financial needs, but it also causes those children to be uh, in the middle of custody struggles and so on and so forth. Anytime you raise the value of the child in terms of dollars and tax dollars, that could lead to kind of custody battles and so on uh, with them, which is somewhat unfortunate. Also, it could sometimes possibly favor people to be unmarried uh, versus married because you could end up in a situation where your earned income tax credit is far higher as a single individual than as married, which again, doesn't seem like the type of incentives that we would want to be having because on the higher income side of things, you typically have a tax incentive to be married because the 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 tax rates are going to be higher, the tables, the tax tables are going to be higher and so on and so forth usually, and you usually have a tax benefit. But for the low income side of things, because of these, the structure of the way these credits are, it actually sometimes incentivizes people not to be married because they, they could get far more on the credit uh, if not married. Uh, and, and again, there's a lot of complexity with the credit. So those are the cons of it. So I think there's some general good ideas with it, but I, but I think there's, it could easily be structured better, in my opinion. So here's a quick table to get an idea of it. This table's not gonna encompass everything, which we'll take a look at in a lot more detail when we get to the tax software examples. But the general idea is the, the credit is tied to the number of children. So zero to three children. If you have more than three children, it has no, long, no more added benefit to the amount of the credit. So if you have no children, it is still possible to get the credit, but it's gonna be far smaller than if you had you know, more children. So again, the children become kind of uh, in the middle of, 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 of possibly custody issues 
because of the dollar value that's put on their head, right? The bounty on the children's head uh, causes, in any case. So then, so it, so the maximum earned income tax credit. So zero children, it could be up to $600, which isn't that high. But if you have the one child, it's to $3,995. Two children could be up to 6,604. And three or more, we're at the 7,430, which of course gets significant. However, that's tied to the income thresholds. So we have the max income single or head of household. Now, these numbers are a little bit deceiving because what we really want to know, remember what happens is your credit actually goes up and peaks at $600 and then it goes back down. So really, you got a couple maximum income numbers that might be useful. One is what's the maximum number for each of these number of children in order to receive the highest amount of the credit, 600 and what's the maximum number of of earnings where you lose the credit entirely right so this one number can't really capture that what you really want to know with the whole curve which we'll see in more detail when we look at the example problems but uh 17 640 if maximum for one child 46,560 for two children 52 918 three children 56 838 and then if married, uh, if married joint filers, we have the 24 to 10 for zero uh, children. And then we have the 53 uh, uh, 120 for one. And then for two children, 59 for 78. Notice again with the married, it's not like it's being doubled here, right? And which, which is the case when we talk about other kind of, of benefits for getting married. If you, if you get married, for example, your your standard deduction uh, basically doubles typically, and the tax rate tables typically double. But for this child tax credit, you, you don't see the doubling of the of the income uh, threshold, and we don't have a change to the maximum uh, earned income tax credit, which actually means that getting mar married isn't increasing. You know, you might actually benefit more not being married with the credit. But so three or more. Uh, we have the 63,398. Okay, so line 27, earned income tax credit. What is the earned income tax credit? The EIC is a credit for certain people who work. The credit may give you a refund even if you don't owe any tax or don't have any tax withheld, meaning it's, it's not really a refund, but we're still going to call it a refund because you didn't overpay the taxes. You're getting a benefit program or welfare type of program. So uh, to take the EIC, follow the steps below. Complete the worksheet that applies to you or let the IRS figure the credit for you. If you have at least one child who meets the conditions to be your qualified child for purposes of claiming the EIC earned income credit, complete and attach schedule EIC. Even if that child doesn't have a valid social security number, see schedule EIC for more information, including how to complete the schedule EIC if your qualifying child doesn't have a social security number. For help in determining if you are eligible for the EIC, go to the irs.gov forward slash EITC. So this is like a tool online that you can use to see if you qualify for the credit. Remember that many low income people might have access to tax software for free if they file before extension time. Uh, and you can look for those on the IRS website, free, free file sort resources, which also could be a great resource. Make sure you choose a tax software that has the capacity to calculate the earned income tax credit and it's something that people should always be checking on, even if they don't think they should file if because they don't owe any taxes, they might still benefit from filing and therefore they might want to you know, check it out, especially if the tax software is free to, to do so. Caution, if you take the earned income tax credit, even though you aren't eligible and it is determined that your error is due to reckless or intentional disregard of the earned income credit rules, you won't be allowed to take the credit for two years if you are otherwise eligible. So this is another one of those credits which are uh, subject to abuse, like any kind of benefit program. Uh, it's going to incentivize people's behaviors to change. And part of that behavioral change, one, one could be around, you know, the, the children custody battles and whatnot, and whether they get married and whatnot. 
uh, but also fraud uh, with, with regards to it. And of course, if the fraud is intentional, then the, the, the tax consequences are, or the consequences will typically be higher. So if you, if you fraudulently take the I, uh, earned income credit, you won't be allowed to take the credit for 10 years. See Form 8862, who must file later. You may also have to pay penalties. Tip. So refunds for returns claiming the earned income credit can't be issued before mid-February 2024. So whenever you take the earned income tax credit, because the IRS knows that it's going to be subject to more people trying to commit fraud, they, they, they want more time to process the returns. So this delay applies to the entire refund, not just the portion associated with the earned income credit. All right, let's just go through the flow chart. I'm on the, the uh, form 1040 instructions under credits. And uh, this, is, this is page 39. So I'm just gonna go through the flow chart and then we'll take a look at tax software examples in a lot of detail in uh, future presentations. All right, so uh, if in 2023, three or more children who have valid social security numbers uh, lived with you is the amount on form 1040 or 1040 SR line 11, less than 56,838. 63,398 if married filing joint. So those are the income limitations. So uh, two, children who have valid social security numbers lived with you, two children <laughs> with that uh, form 1040 line 11, less than 52. So this is your adjusted gross income. Here's the income threshold with the two children. One child uh, who has a valid social security lived with you in the amount on the form 1040, that's the adjusted gross income. Here's the income thresholds. If you're above these thresholds, then you're typically not gonna qualify, right? 46, 560, 53, uh, 120 if married, no children, the threshold 17, 640, and 24, 210 if married. So if yes, you continue. If uh, no, then you can't claim because you're above the income thresholds. So do you and your spouse of filing joint returns have a social security number issued on or before the due date of your 2023 return, including extension that allows you to do, 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 work uh, and is valid for EIC earned income tax purposes? If yes, we continue. If no, you can't take the credit. So you need the social security number. Are you filing form 2555 related to foreign earned income? So that's going to complicate things because the foreign earned income always does. So we're going to generally say no and continue on. No, continue. Where uh, Were you or your spouse a non-resident alien for any part of 2023? Obviously, being a non-resident alien could complicate things. If yes, see non-resident alien later under definitions and special rules. If no, go to step two. So we're going to say no and go to step two. Invest uh, Investment income. Add the amounts uh, from Form 1040 or 1040SR, line 2A, 2B, 2, uh, 3B. We're looking investment income here. Investment income you can think of as generally interest and dividends. Now, why do we need to look at investment income? Why might that be relevant? Because we're trying to help people out here that have low income. If you have, But if you have a bunch of money in stocks and bonds, then although your income earnings are low, you might have a bunch of, you might not need an earned income tax credit. How could we determine that? Well, if you got a lot of income from interest and dividends, that would indicate that you have a lot of money invested in stocks and bonds. And therefore, if your investment income is high, you would think that could limit your ability to take the earned income tax credit. So if line seven is a loss, enter zero. Is your investment income more than 11,000? So you might say 11,000 looks a little low, but remember 11,000 isn't your earned income, not W-2 income. It's from dividends and interest, which means you had to have a significant amount of, of money invested in stocks and bonds to pull 11,000 of income. So if, if we say, is your more than that? Uh, if yes, continue, no, skip to three, uh, go to question four. So, so we're going to say normally we would, we're going to skip question three and go to four. So l question three, are you filing form 4797 related to sale of business and so on? And then we would, but we're going to skip to go to question four. So do any of the following apply for 2023? 
you are filing Schedule E. So that has to do with real estate. So again, we're trying to help people that have lower income thresholds. If you own property, real estate, then it seems like you have a substantial amount of assets. It might not be liquid. You might not be earning income on it. You might have to sell the assets in order to pay your taxes, but uh, it's not like you're, you're, you, that would be doable, you would think, right? So that might limit your earned income tax credit. You are reporting income from the rental of personal property not used in a trader business. You are filing Form 8814 relating to election to report a child's interest and dividends on your return. You have income or loss from a passive activity. So uh, yes, use Worksheet 1 and Publication 596 to see if you can take the credit. If no, go to Step 3. Let's go to Step 3. Qualifying child. So now we have those kids involved here. So a qualifying child uh, for the earned income credit is a child who is your son, daughter, stepchild, foster child, brother, sister, stepbrother, stepsister, half-brother, half-sister, or decedent of any of them. So usually this kind of question, this this dovetails in on qualifications for a dependent, which, which we've talked about in prior sections or courses. And when you think about a dependent, remember the general idea is the dependent, if they qualify, might allow you to get the child tax credit. And if they don't qualify for the child tax credit, then possibly the other dependent credit. The other benefit you might have from the child is that it could have an impact on your earned income tax credit if you qualify for it because your income is below uh, a certain threshold. So in any case, and uh, under age 19 at the end of 2023 and younger than you. So there's our age limitation of uh, 19. Remember that age limitations could be different for qualifying as a dependent, the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. So you have to get those age limitations uh, straight under age 24 at the end of 2023 a student defined later and younger than you so this is mirroring kind of like the uh, qualifications to be a dependent any age and permanently and totally disabled and uh, who wasn't filing a joint return so typically they're not married uh, and usually they wouldn't be at that age but some people get married uh, at, at younger ages and whatnot so who isn't married or filing a joint return for 2023 only to claim a refund of withheld income taxes or estimated tax paid and who lived with you in the United States for more than half of 2023. So this is kind of mirroring the dependence, uh, the, the dependence requirements. So and who lived with you caution, you can't take a credit for a child who didn't live with you for more than half the year, even if you paid most of the child's living expenses, the IRS may ask you for documents, how would they prove that you'd have documentation on in terms of their mailing and stuff tip, if the child didn't live with you for more than half 2023, because of a temporary absence, birth, death, or kidnapping, you could see exceptions. So we saw this with the dependents. If they didn't live with you half the year because they had like like a there was a birth or something like that, they weren't around for half the year, or they they uh, had an, a medical issue, so they were in the hospital or something. They would still you would think be counted as living with you even though they're like in the hospital or something like that, right? So caution. So if the child meets the conditions to be a qualifying child of any other person other than your spouse, if filing a joint return for 2023, see qualifying child. So here's where the real issue comes up because of course, putting all this weight on children for benefits for taxes has implications in terms of, again, the family structure, married versus single individuals and who's going to qualify, uh, who, who gets to to take the child on their tax return. So there's a price on that kid's head, you know, and we <laughs> wars will be fought. In any case, so number one, uh, do you do you have at least one child who meets the conditions to be your qualifying child for the purpose of claiming the EIC? So if yes, continue. If no, skip to two through six, uh, go to step four. So are you filing a joint return for 2023? If yes, skip to question three through six. Uh, if no, continue. So we're going to go up here and just go through it straight through. Number three, are you a married taxpayer whose filing status is married filing separate or head of household? If yes, continue. If no, 
uh, skip question four and go to five to question six. Did you or your spouse have the same principal residence for at least six months in 2023? If yes, continue. No, skip to question five. Go to question six. Number five, you are legally separated according to your state law under a written separation agreement or decree of separate maintenance and you lived apart from your spouse at the end of 2023. So we saw these kind of issues when we talked about uh, whether someone uh, qualifies for like head of household or single status, for example. Uh, and when we talked about dependents, right? You've got these issues as to whether someone is married or they are separated. Oftentimes that comes down to the state because the state is gonna determine what it means to be married typically, but we're talking about that for federal taxes. So the federal tax system wants to then try to put up their own rules for what a separation means for federal taxes. And you've got this weird interplay between the state and the Fed stepping on each other's toes. So could you be a qualifying child of another person for 2023? So check no if the other person isn't required to file and isn't filing a 2023 tax return or is filing a 2023 return only to claim a refund. So, okay, filers without a qualifying child. So now we're at that part if we were to skip up here when we don't have a qualifying child. Number one, so are you a married taxpayer whose filing status is married filing separate or head of household? So we're gonna say, uh, if yes, you can't take the credit. If no, we're gonna continue uh, forward. So typically if you're married filing separate, that's gonna, that's, remember if you're married, you typically your only options are married filing joint and married filing separate. If you file married filing separate, the IRS is gonna be skeptical of you limiting things like credits because they think you're going to basically do that in order to manipulate the thresholds of things like their earned income tax credit just for tax reasons. Number two, so were you, so basically you would think you'd have to be single. If you were single, you would be filing either as single or head of household. If you have a qualifying child that qualifies for the credit, you would think you would be filing as head of household, right? So you were, uh, were you or your spouse if filing a joint return at least age 25, but under uh, age 65 at the end of 2023, check yes if you or your spouse of filing a joint return were born after December 31st, 1958 and before January 2nd, 1999. If your spouse died in 2023 or if you are preparing a return for someone who died in 2023, see publication 596 before you answer. So if yes, we can continue. If no, you can't take the credit. So notice we have this age threshold. Were you or your spouse if filing a joint return at least age 25, but under 65? Now, why would they do that kind of age threshold? You would think that they might be able to be claimed as a dependent in some cases up to like 24 if they were a full-time student. So we're looking at people that are kind of like in their working years I th is the idea. And if they're over 65, then, then there might be other kind of programs that deal with them like social security and whatnot because they're basically in uh, retirement age. So number three, was your, was your main home and your, and your spouse's if filing a joint return in the United States for more than half of 2023, members of the military stationed outside the United States see members of the military later. So yes, continue. If no, you can't take the credit. Number four, are you filing a joint return for 2023? Uh, if yes, skip question five and six, go to step five. If no, continue. Let's say no and continue. Five, could you be a qualifying child of another person for 2023? Meaning you could be their dependent in essence. Check no if the other person isn't required to file and isn't filing a 2023 tax return. So if yes, you can't take the credit because you're basically kind of like a dependent. If no, continue. Number six, can you be claimed as a dependent on someone else's 2023 tax return if the person who could claim you blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's go to the step five, earned income. So are you filing schedule SE because you were a member of the clergy or, or you had church employee income of $108.28 or more? So we have this clergy thing, which is, a, a, again, a kind of a weird kind of exception that has this low income threshold because it's been in there forever. 
If yes, the clergy or church employees, whichever applies, no. Uh, if no, complete the following worksheet. So, so enter the amount from form 1040-1040-SR, uh, line 1Z, enter the, the Medicaid waiver payment, and so on and so forth. And so subtract those out. Do, 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 do. So this is your earned income. Let's keep on number four. Enter all your non-taxable combat pay if you elect to include it in earned income. We'll take a look at the combat pay if you're in the military and you have combat pay. Then, then you could have choices as, in terms of how you're going to treat that combat pay. Typically, the IRS, you would think they would want to give a benefit. If you're in combat, they're going to allow you to not include it in, in income possibly, which usually is good. But if you're qualified for the earned income tax credit, it might be beneficial to include it in income because your earned income credit could go up with income. So we'll take a look at some examples of combat pay and how it, and the impact it could have hopefully in our tax software examples so you can see that if it comes up. So electing to include non-combat pay may increase or decrease the earned income credit, figure the credit with and without. So that's another area where the, the credit becomes quite complex <laughs> to kind of figure. All right, number two. Were you self-employed at the end of 2023 or are you filing Schedule SE because you were a member of the clergy or had a church employee income or are you filing Schedule C as a statutory employee? If yes, skip to question three. If no, continue. So uh, if you have three or more qualifying children who have valid social security numbers, is your income less than, here's the thresholds, the 56838. Uh, for two qualifying children, the 52918, or if married, the 59478, and so on and so forth. Uh, if yes, go to step six. If no, you can't take the credit because you're over the income thresholds. So number six, how to figure the credit. Do you want the IRS to figure the credit for you? If yes, see credit figuring by IRS. If no, go to worksheet A. Typically, we would often be using software these days and the software can help us to figure the credit, which will be using the, the concepts, of course, of worksheet A. And then if you have special definitions that you're looking up, then these are in the instructions. I won't go through all of them, but the, the adopted child we talked about is usually considered as, as your child if they're adopted. Church employees, which is a special situation. Combat pay, so you can get into definitions of what that is and the impacts it can have. We'll talk, take a look at scenarios credit figured by the IRS if you want that to look in that option more exception to the time lived with you meaning they have to t the kid has to basically live with you but then we have all these kinds of exceptions as to whether they would still qualify form 4797 form 8862 who must file do, 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 do. foster child married child members of the military non-resident aliens if that applies to you permanently and totally disabled what does that mean uh qualifying child and more than uh of more than one person which gets into that custody kind of issue who can claim the the child the kid's got a, a bounty on their head who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna claim it social security number ssn and welfare benefits affected uh, effect of the credit. So what what are the what are the impacts? Which again is part of the thing we were talking about, where uh, the credit could you know people run into problems with the credits because they could have a, a an impact on other programs because there could be state and local programs that take into consideration income from different sources as to whether you'd qualify for those programs and so on. So that's the general idea. We'll take a look at some software examples to really get a feel uh, for the credit because there's, it's kind of interesting the way the whole thing uh, plays out, looking at scenarios for different income levels and different number of children and, uh, and what the impacts might be if you were to like be single and then get married, right? If you have two people that had one child, for example, or maybe you had two people that, had, that both had three child and they were maxing out the credit on both sides what would happen if they got married right it probably wouldn't it wouldn't be good for taxes possibly it might it might work out quite to the detriment which is kind of an interesting outcome you know it's kind of a weird so so and so when what does that mean from a policy perspective is this credit structured well or not uh it could it be improved to make it you know better